is. And so, brothers, let's go ahead and get into our Bible studies tonight. Um, again, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this series of studies on men's training class. Um, all these lessons build upon one another. They're all interdependent. And uh, just like the links of a chain. And so if you miss one of these classes, whether it's taught by me or Eddie or Joe or Jeff, uh, it's like missing a link in that chain. And so uh, please try to be a part of every single Bible study that we have. Um, this will be our third study together on this subject. You remember the first study last week was defining terms and then setting forth the goals and objectives of this class. And then the second lesson was on Sunday morning. It's the scriptural work of a local congregation. And uh, this evening, we're going to be summarizing a few of those Bible terms and then getting into a pattern, what I see as a consistent pattern revealed in the Bible uh, for effective teaching. And really, it's a pattern uh, Eddie and I were just talking about that's used in everyday life. And whether we realize it or not, consciously aware of this or not, we use this pattern of communication in a lot of different things. Um, and then try to look at differences, though many things overlap in communication, whether it's Bible communication or secular communication, there are huge differences that exist between the message we may have in a secular context as opposed to a spiritual context. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. And uh, Adam, would you please lead that prayer for us? Grace, merciful Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity be in fellowship with one another, to study and learn your word. Uh, we pray that you bless our hearts and our minds for what we have here in the evening, that we will uh, take it in and be able to use it in our everyday life for your will and purpose in the new world. And we pray for all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, just, just quick review. Uh, when the, when the, uh, subject of the work of a local congregation comes up, uh, we need to know what does the New Testament teach about the work of a local church? Uh, what are the, the overall, what are the overall fundamental works of a local congregation according to the New Testament? What would you give uh, number one? Okay, edify the saved. Thank you, brother. Um, and we know that from many passages, 1 Corinthians 14 and Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, among the many passages that teach that is a primary work of a local congregation. Of course, under that edification, we would put God's uh, avenues of worship to him and building up one another as teaching, prayer, spiritual singing, um, the Lord's Supper, all of those avenues that God has provided so that he is glorified and that is accomplished, edification. Um, okay, what's another work of a local congregation? The training, okay, and I would, and that's right, brother, because it says that in Ephesians 4, and I would put that under edification as well, uh, where it says equipping the saints to do the work of service. Basically, you're training the saints, are, are you not? I think that would be fair uh, to say that. That would be synonymous with saying equipping, training the saints to do the work of service. Um, so, what, what's another work, though, that we need to be involved? Do you see it in Acts 13? We're Acts 13, the first few verses there. Okay, evangelizing the lost, uh, the message to the lost. And you see a local church 
uh, Antioch of Syria, sending out uh, Paul and Barnabas to do that work. So evangelizing the lost. And you see the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14, where you know you had these nine gifts being exercised when they were done. And one of the gifts was the gift of tongues or languages other than that known by the speaker, the Holy Spirit miraculously revealing that. And that was for the believer or the unbeliever? The unbeliever. So God makes provision in his congregation for the unbeliever. So that shows us that one of the works of a local church is evangel evangelization of the lost. And of course, then benevolence or charity to needy saints. We see that in 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Acts 11, and many other places. And then, a, and then there's always instructive discipline. There's always that work going on. But sometimes there's a breakdown, just as there is in a home and a spiritual family. There's a breakdown in instructive discipline. And someone just rebels, turns their back. Uh, on the Lord, and there, there needs to be a corrective, corrective discipline that's carried out, and we see that in 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Thessalonians 3, Romans 16, uh, 17, and many other passages where there's, on occasion, there's a need for correct, corrective discipline. That's not talking about a brother or sister who stumbles from time to time repents and confesses that sin, we all do that. We all stumble from time to time. But it's someone who has turned their back on the Lord and has gone into apostasy. They're not serving the Lord faithfully. And uh, so th that needs to be done from time to time. Now, these are the four fundamental works uh, of a local congregation we see revealed in the, the New Testament. Um, this evening, look with me at the, in the study material. Do you have your booklet, by the way? Hopefully you have your booklet. Anyone not have one of these? Okay. I've got a few extra here. Anybody here? Yes, sir. There you go. Who else? There you go, Matt. Okay. How you doing? Good to see you. Anybody else? Okay. Got. To, can you share with someone here? Anybody? And this over here. How are you doing, Michael? All right. Uh, all right, open if in the, the booklets, if you would. That's, if there's extra somewhere, let me know. We can hand those out as well. Um, the work of an evangelist, where it says summary. The work of an evangelist summary, please, brothers. Uh, Adam, a favor. At the end of this class, would you lead us in the song, There is Room in the Kingdom, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, in summary of terms. So summary of uh, definitions we gave last week. A preacher, see where I am? A preacher under uh, the work of an evangelist, summary of terms, and then the term given is preacher. Everybody there? Okay. Uh, what, who is a preacher? What is a, a term, what is a literal definition of that Greek term? Herox. What does he do? He's a herald. He's a herald, which points to a private or more public in nature teaching. More public in nature. And hence your basic difference between teacher and a herald or a preacher. His work is more public proclamation. A teacher could be private, it could be public, uh, could be any, any uh, number involved, but it, he's an imparter of information. He is one who instructs, who gives information. He also could do it in a public way as well as private, but the basic difference is public as opposed to private. Uh, what about an evangelist? What is an evangelist? What does he do? Literal meaning of the term. Good news. Proclaimer of good. So he's, he's a herald of good, a herald of glad tidings. And then uh, uh, what about the minister? Sometimes uh, th that term is used in reference to the teacher. 
What does that mean? Da'akonos. He's a servant. So, doula servant in relation to the master, we're all that. Da'akonos servant in relation to the work we do, in the relation to the work that we do. And uh, in this case, he is a servant of what? What's the work the teacher is doing? A servant of the word. Servant of the word or servant of the gospel. Servant of the gospel, servant of Christ in teaching his word. All these terms describe some aspect of the evangelist work. There are no titles. There's no clergy layman distinctions in Christ's kingdom. Um, so the origin, look now, the origin of the evangelist or the teacher's work. Um, so it's a gift of Christ. We saw that in Ephesians 4, looked at that passage last week. It's a distinct part of God's plan that there be teachers and preachers. Secondly, the evangelist, as all the teaching functionaries of Ephesians 4, provides a service. This service is summarized in Ephesians 4 and given practical application. In what letters of the New Testament do we find uh, specifically information to evangelists? For Second Timothy and Titus. So if you want to learn the specific work of an evangelist, read those two letters, First and Second Timothy, Titus, outline the letters, and especially note the instructions specifically given by Paul to Timothy, specifically given by Paul to Titus, and you'll know God's revealed work for an evangelist because that's where you'll find that. Um, okay, the uniqueness of preaching, uniqueness of preaching. In some ways, preaching is like other forms of communication. You have an introduction, one or two primary topics, a body of supportive thoughts, a conclusion, etc. But preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is a special kind of communication and therefore differs in many respects from other forms of teaching. Uh, list some of the ways Preaching the gospel differs from other forms of communication. Now, there are similarities. Principles of teaching, principles of communication will overlap in many different areas. Uh, Joe and I have talked about this, how you know, a number of the principles that we've talked about will overlap. Uh, and they're logical, uh, in a logical sequence uh, in which they're given. And keep in mind, the Holy Spirit is revealing this word through these men, and yet they'll follow the same logical sequence that you'll follow in your secular communication on your job or maybe to your child, to your spouse. Uh, it could be a coach telling the team, okay, guys, um, this is the need that we have. We're weak on defense. And so um, here's what we need to do. One, two, three, four, five. Now, are we going to do it? Yes, we are, coach. And then the coach will say, well, let's do it then, right? He's going to urge them to do it. And, and that's, that's a logical sequence. And that's the same logical sequence that you'll find the Holy Spirit uh, using in revealing this message. And uh, I think there are five primary sequences or uh, steps uh, in this sequence, and uh, we'll look at those in just a moment. But before we do, what would you say, brothers, is, a, 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 let's say, a main difference, even though there are things that overlap between secular teaching and spiritual teaching, such as what you do here? Um, and by the way, it, it, it's not, I want to say this again, it's not for everybody. There, there are brothers that they don't intend, let's say, to teach or preach. You may end up doing that, through circumstances that, that were unforeseen. But if you, you never do, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here and supporting the men that uh, want to increase that ability, the better themselves in that area, uh, who, who want to start doing that. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate that very, very much. Um, so now, what, what are some, some things that make Preaching the gospel, very different from something that you might, you know, present in a secular 
context. Yes, brother. First thing that comes to mind for me is that we're talking about something that is spread. There's yeah. nothing in this world that is spread. Okay, yeah. This is the most important thing that goes into this world. Okay, so you're talking about, uh, you know, not what's going to happen, happen next week, next month, or next year. We're talking about eternity here, right? We're talking about, so the, the primary emphasis is not something physical. It's not your IRA. It's, it's not, you know, uh, something you, you'll present in a school classroom on English or math. We're talking about uh, your soul here. We're talking about um, reward or consequence that's forever. That, that makes it pretty weighty. Uh, and that's the reason, you know, appreciate that. That's the reason for this observation is to, to say to you, brothers, that though there are, there are principles that overlap in secular and in the spiritual teaching, uh, the surpassing value of your subject in teaching here before a class or before the assembly of God's people uh, is, cannot be measured. It cannot be measured. The surpassing value of what you're offering to the precious souls that are here. Every single soul is very, very precious to God. And right now it's in your hands to help that soul draw closer to him. Uh, even if in some small way, it's, it is very important. Um, so I want to impress that upon you. That's the reason I make this observation. Uh, what are some other differences to impress that upon us, how extremely important this is? Okay, uh, what is the source of this teaching? It's God. We're saying, okay, I've got a message today. It's from God. <laughs> it's not from my employer. It's not from me. It's from God. And all scripture is inspired by God. And even if, you know, whatever uh, degree or, you know, choices you make in presenting that material, uh, as long as you stick to that text and don't add your own, I think so, and your own ideas, it's a message from God. Maybe just read the passage. That makes it pretty weighty. And, uh, of course, it's truly from God. It is absolute truth, which our world uh, doesn't believe anymore, doesn't believe they're absolute truths. Uh, but the Bible is absolute truth. It is the only moral measure of man, the only roadmap to heaven, it is the only absolute truth there is, God's word. Anything else that shows your, your responsibility is weighty in doing this, very weighty. Yeah, David? Okay, okay. You're, go ahead, brother. Yeah. A amen to that, David. That's that's exactly right. So David's comments uh, were in regard to what you're presenting is evidence that is more reasonable. It makes it more reasonable to believe or have faith in God and what he says than whatever man has to present, which we believe is less reasonable. It is more reasonable to believe in this based on the evidence that we have. And so put faith in God, faith in his promises, faith in um, 
his way of life. But we're, we're truly saying that this, this is something that is life-changing. It will forgive. But basically, we're looking at an intangible. It's something intangible, right? It's not something they can have right now. But it's something that's beyond this life. And to get someone to change 180 degrees their mind on something, is you think about the challenge of that, you and I won't be able to do that. I can't do that. There's no way. The only way that's going to happen is if that word is presented truly, accurately. I don't get in its way. I let God do his work through his word. And that word works in a good and honest heart, germinates, takes root, grows into this marvelous person who's now ready to change their entire life based on what they believe. You think about that. Resurrected, as it were, from the dead. Only God's word can do that. And I've seen it obviously happen in your lives. Some of you, I see the results of it in most of you. But I've seen God do that in the lives of many a person, a witch, alcoholic, drug, heroin drug addict, uh, a man that I knew back in uh, St. Peter's, Missouri. I, I've seen it and, and serving the Lord faithfully now. It's, it's been uh, eight years, eight years serving the Lord faithfully. Uh, that's God's word can do that. Yes, brother. So I'm trying to frame this thought, and when you mention faith, that helps, and I think that's kind of key. But something that I have observed in the past really bothered me is when you have a non Christian, and I mean a non Christian in the broad sense, I'm just talking about a non Christian Christ, somebody who's not accepted Christ teaching in a seminary. So I mean, I came to the brain during the Jewish woman down in Tennessee at one seminary, she teaches Christian. How to be Christian. She wrote a book with uh, Professor Daniel O'Dannison. And I told you to me, how can I yeah. to be the person I'm interested in? And so when you use some faith, though, I thought right. that we said that all the time, uh -huh. which is why I forgot. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes with God. Uh, it doesn't just impart knowledge, it imparts faith. Amen. And I think that's one of the reasons. A person who counts, how can a person who does not have faith, how can they hope to impart that faith? Amen. Amen, brother. It truly points to the power of the gospel. And one of the greatest examples of what Mike is saying there is power's in the word is not in you and me. You have to trust that word. And is is uh Jonah. Jonah did not want those people to repent. He went to Nineveh hoping they wouldn't repent. But what happened? They repented. Why? He preached the word of God. Yet 40 days, none of us shall be overthrown. And they heard the word of God, and it, it went into their heart, and it affected them such that from the king down to the common man, they're, they're repenting in dust and ashes. But it's in the word. And, and, you know, Paul, brother, also, he talks about in Philippians, men who are preaching the word out of envy. Think about that. Preaching it out of envy. For whatever reason, thinking to, to do him harm while he's in prison. Yeah, they were getting converts because the word is that powerful. It's that powerful. Of course, we want to preach it out of sincerity. Paul says the goal of our instruction is love. Every single message, 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal is love, to bring about the fruit of love, love for God, love for one another, and of course, to grow in, in those areas. But uh, yeah, it's definitely know the message, preach the message, emphasize the message, live the message, make it even more powerful. Yeah, brother. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. We are preaching natural truth. Mm -hmm. We're teaching the facts about God, the things that are revealed about God, and then letting that truth develop that conviction in things that the people don't actually see themselves. Sure. And I think that's how you get that mm -hmm. conundrum of teaching something that people don't see. But again, you're not speculating about it. You're telling them absolutely. Sure. Sure. And, and uh, you know, I've read material by a number of different writers, brethren, and everything I have, I know about them and their life, they're not Christians. But, well, that sure is a good point. You know, that observation from the Word of God, it, 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 it doesn't dissolve, uh, you know, or diminish maybe what they're saying. Uh, you just you just find yourself thinking, well, why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? You know, but in any case, the, the main point is this. Second Timothy chapter four, verse two. What does that say? Everybody look at it if you don't know what it says. What does Second Timothy chapter four, verse two say? Preach the word. Not your word, not my word. Preach the word. Preach the word. When I decided to preach the gospel, there was an occasion when a bunch of brethren were together, and there was one brother. I don't know how many times he said this to me. He knew I was just, I'd made a decision to devote my life to preaching and teaching the word. And so he came up to me a number of times and he said, MC, preach the word. And then he walked away. Five, 10 minutes later, he come back to Dempsey, preach the word. And he'd walk away, do something else. He said that to me a number of times. And it's been 47 years, and I still remember it. Preach the word, not your word, my word, Christ's word. Be ready in season, out of season, when it's opportune, inopportune. Uh, for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, healthy, wholesome doctrine. Uh, but you preach the word. Okay, we, we need to, uh, let's move on. Thank you. Thank you for that good discussion. Good, good comments. Very, very helpful. Um, if you would uh, look at the next page, please, the work of an evangelist continued. Uh, and the, uh, the paradigm or the pattern of teaching, we find the second, the goal of our instruction is love, Paul says. And then the, the next paragraph, behind every Bible command, there's the person of God and his purpose. God always has a purpose for everything he says, everything he does. Both positive and negative commands are used in scripture to help us understand and accomplish his purpose. A consistent pattern of teaching can also be, be seen within the scripture, a paradigm. This pattern consists of five basic parts, and here they are as I see them. Now, there could be, you may say, I think there's less. You may say more. That's fine. This is what I see as a consistent pattern. Uh, the preacher, that's you. The need, I see a need. Third, relevant information that will help that need for proper response to that situation. And then finally, motivation, urging them to do that. All five elements are interconnected. So in practical terms now, in practical terms, the preacher, you, the teacher, in whatever capacity you're serving, you see a need and you seek to convince your audience of this need, that's number two. So, and there, there's a number of things that will be involved in each one of these. One of them, brothers, is prayer. Prayer. Okay, we, we put prayer at the top of the list. Before I came to this class, what do you think I did? Well, I prayed a number of times. I prayed. And I prayed that, that a number of things, God would give me a clear mind, wisdom and strength, uh, courage to say the things I need to say. Um, hearts would be open, ready to receive the word. 
there are many, many things we need to pray before we teach the Word of God. Are, are we going to teach the Word of God without first putting that opportunity before the throne of God? I don't think we should do that. Whether we're leading singing or we're teaching a class or waiting on the table, I believe we need to set that before the throne of God before we use that blessed opportunity, don't you? So prayer is a big part of that. So we've prayed that we, we evaluate a need. We, we assess accurately the need of this person or this class or this assembly. Here's a congregation. It has a number of needs. Lord, help me to see accurately what those needs are. And now we, you know, we, we try to answer those needs. You're not always right. You know, maybe you're trying to be proactive and maybe you're not spot on. You're, you're, you're way off, but you're, you're trying to constantly do that. Okay. Uh, and then a third, you, the teacher, then provide Bible teaching to explain and address this need, any information that's relevant to the need. And again, you know, that will depend on who you're talking to, their age, uh, male or female, knowledge. But you're, you're, you're presenting information to address the need. Fourth, the right response to this need is instruction on what you do now that we are aware of this. So how to solve it? What does the Holy Spirit reveal is the way to solve this, at least in principle, if not something specifically? Now, we're talking about salvation. We know exactly what to do because the Holy Spirit has shown us that. Uh, fifth, then you urge people. So we've, we have tried to assess a need. We're addressing that need. We're showing what God reveals as the answer, the right response to that need. In principle, if we don't see a specific answer, and then we urge people to do it. Now, this is a very important part, and Eddie will bring this out, I'm sure, more in his lesson, is persuasion. Brethren, teaching is not done until we add persuasion to that, right? There's got to be that element in there for it to be successful. Can you think of a number of messages in the New Testament? You go to the Old Testament as well, but I think there's plenty in the New Covenant where there was urging or persuasion after the message was given. So they said, this is the message, this is what you need to do, and then let's do it. Can you think of any passages where that, that is the case? How about Acts 2? After the message, repent and be baptized. Do you remember what Peter says then? This is for the promises for you and your children, as many far off as the Lord our God shall call. And then he says, be saved. Don't be lost. Be saved from this wicked and perverse generation. So he's still persuading, Acts 2.40. You know, the devil is trying to push people downward. Can we nudge them into heaven? Can we do that? Can we urge them to go to heaven? You know, give them heaven, brother. Give them heaven. <laughs> Can we do that? So we see Acts 2.40. There's an example. Any other examples of persuasion? It's okay to teach the message and then urge them to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I wish in every other way you're like me except for these chains. Good. How about, yes, sir, you got an example? Okay. Let, let me finish this point, if I may, Teddy. So can, can you think of Paul... Okay, okay, it says that specifically. Knowing the fear of the Lord, verse 11, we persuade men. And he just talked about judgment, verse 10. So how about Ananias? What did Ananias say to Paul? Remember Ananias, when he came to him, he said, why are you waiting? That's persuasion. Why are you waiting? Um, one of the parables, Jesus said, you know, when when... When people wouldn't come to his dinner, Luke 14, go out to the lanes, the highways, the byways, and, and do what? 
compel them, compel them to come in. If so, I don't like to be pushed. Well, you're being pushed away from God. Can I nudge you in the right direction because I love you and care about you? Well, sure, they did. It's a, it's a part, it's an essential part of successful teaching. Teaching is not done until the element of urging is and persuasion is in there. And it is urgent. It is urgent. Because we don't know about tomorrow. We don't know. It is urgent. Okay, we're we are almost out of time. But I, I want to look at look at uh, Acts 2. Let's go to Acts 2 real quickly here. I wanted to sing, uh, ask Adam to lead us in a song here, and I want to do that as well. But let's at least do this example of the five uh, elements uh, in a pattern of teaching. So in Acts 2, obviously the teacher is Peter. And uh, what is the need in Acts 2 and in most of the chapters of Acts? What is the need? The, the salvation of men, because we're looking at the gospel of the kingdom going forth. God has given the marching orders. And so they're going forth. And here it's, it's Jews who need to, uh, need to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God and Savior. So how does Peter address that need? Actually, you know Acts 2. So how does he address that need? Jesus is the Messiah. How is he going to get that message across? What does he do? Okay, so you've got, you know, he just basically he just goes down the list of proofs. He's the verse 22. He says, hey, signs, wonders, and miracles were done by Jesus. You yourselves know. And he can say you yourselves know because they knew. That's true. And then in verse 23, he says he was, the, he was prophesied. He fulfills everything God said the Messiah would fulfill. And then beginning in verse 24, what's the, what's the primary thrust of the message? He was what? Resurrected. So he worked miracles. Only God can do that. He fulfills all prophecy. He's resurrected. And he quotes David in Psalm 16. So now the next step in the pattern is, what's, what does he say is the proper response to their situation? So you got a preacher, Peter. Uh, here's a need, their salvation. Here's the message. Jesus is Messiah based on these facts. And now what's the right response to, the, to that information? Repent, be baptized. And then what does Peter do in verse 40? He urges them to do it. Be saved from this wicked and perverse generation. To be saved from that generation. Um, he's going to ring the bell in a minute, right? Is, do you, how much time we got? We got about another. Okay, okay. Let's look at Acts 3. Look at Acts 3. Uh, who's the preacher in Acts 3? Who's the teacher? Peter? <laughs> Let's sing the song anyway, brother. Let's go ahead and stop there. I want to sing this song. And uh, maybe another time we can look at some of these. And you can do it with chapters as well as books, entire books. All right. Uh, you know the number, brother? Okay. Five eight seven, five eight seven. Where we got kingdom? <clears throat> Don't so leave. There is room in the kingdom of God, my brother, for the small things that you can do. Just a small kindly deed that may cheer up. Another is the work God has planned for you. There is room. There's a place in the kingdom of God for you. There is room. There's a place. There's a work that we all can do. Just a cup of cold water in his name, given may the hope in some heart renew. Do not wait to be told, nor by sorrow, 
driven to the work God has planned for you. There is room, there's a place in the kingdom of God for you. There is room, there's a place. There is work that we all can do. There's a place in the service of God for workers who are loyal to him and true. Can't you say to him now, I will leave the sugars and the work thou hast planned, I will do. There is room. There's a place in the kingdom of God for you. There is room. There's a place. There is work that we all can do.